Well, thank you, Professor Weinberg, for that very warm and friendly introduction. Uh, it's, it's impossible for me to begin this presentation uh, without expressing my sincerest thanks to Professor and Dean uh, Tace Lambericks for making possible my stay in Moden uh, during the past year. And to do this, I would like to read something from the preface to the book on which I have been working. I like Hagnido's idiosyncratic habit of writing the prefaces of books before writing the books. Uh, and that's because it gives me a kind of eschatological hope that uh, someday it will be completed. In any case, in my, preference, my preface, I write this. I am especially grateful to Professor Matej Lamericks for his invitation to join in the work of the research group on the history of church and theology, and to the other members of the faculty for their hospitality, Peter Dumay, Anthony Dupont, Rob Basin, Wim Francois, Leo Kennis, Thomas Knieps, Johann Lehmans, Joss Verheyden, Therese Kwanisager, and the many other students and professors with whom I have interacted. Kagi Lubin was the ideal place to pursue this study. Its incomparable library, outmatched only by the erudition and collegiality of its faculty. So, I hope that my lecture tonight uh, and the writings that eventually follow will offer some small recompense to the faculty for all the benefits that I have received. My topic tonight, sexual continence and priesthood in ancient Christianity, as Professor Lambert already mentioned, is a subject that has been quite frequently studied, uh, especially in the decades since the close of the Second Vatican Council. Scholars associated with Kayulub or the Bellanov have often been in the forefront of this discussion. The most distinguished example is the magisterial study by Roger Brisson, Les Origines du Célébat Ecclesiastique, which appears in 1970. Another example is the important collection of essays edited by Joseph Coppins, Sacerdos et Célébat. Etudes historiques et théologiques, published the following year. In fact, these two volumes will help to pose the central question I wish to address this evening. What was the primary reason, or reasons, for the appearance of a requirement of permanent sexual continence for the higher clergy in the Western Church? Note that I'm not speaking about the rule of clerical celibacy which was promulgated in the, the 12th century, uh, and also not speaking about married popes, per se, but rather my topic is the rule of permanent sexual abstinence or continence that was imposed on married clerics in the Western Church in the 4th century. My central argument is that the work of Grison has been unfairly criticized, and that the notion of ritual purity and we'll talk in detail about that, but the notion of ritual purity with some modification has to be retrieved as the basis of the Western requirement of clerical sexual continence. I will first review the main themes of Brisson's work and that of some of his critics. Secondly, then, I will turn to the primary sources to establish the ritual dimensions of the requirement, and finally, but only very briefly, I will turn or examine the function of the continence requirement in establishing hierarchy and sacred identity of the Christian minister as priest. So first, Grisson. In his book, Grisson had acknowledged that a variety of influences were at work in the development of the sexual continence requirement, such as the rise of the monastic movement and a generally negative evaluation of sex among the church fathers. But his central argument was that the requirement of permanent sexual continence for the clergy was founded primarily on a ritual or cultic taboo. Sexual intercourse, Brisson suggested, was seen as the source of ritual rather than moral impurity. 
and therefore as something that rendered a person unfit for participation in sacred rituals. The critical shift to a requirement of perpetual or permanent sexual abstinence occurred in the late fourth century when daily Eucharist became common in the West. At that point, Pisan argued, the previous practice of temporary sexual abstinence before Eucharist became a law of permanent sexual abstinence. Pisan's argument provoked responses from several quarters. Among the most prominent critics was the distinguished Jesuit patrologist Henri Cruzel, writing in the volume of essays edited by Collins that I just mentioned. Cruzel argued that Brisson's book failed to appreciate the diversity of motives involved in the emergence of the continent's requirement. While not denying that ritual continence was a factor, Cruzel emphasized that a mixture of motives was at work. He listed first the influence of biblical teachings, such as the eschatological sayings of Jesus in the Gospels, and Paul's discussion of marriage, 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, secondly, he mentions the presence of the Greek philosophical bias against sex and pleasure, especially evident in Stoicism, which had great impact on early Christianity. And thirdly, a widespread sense of defilement or impurity in bodily activities that derived from Platonism, but that found expression especially in the influential teaching of Origen of Alexandria. In the following decades, several more scholars challenged Brisson's emphasis on ritual purity and argued that philosophical, moral, or ascetical concerns provided the main impetus for the rise of clerical sexual continence. The most recent voice in the debate has been that of Richard Price, who wrote the article on clerical celibacy in volume 36 the Theologische Reale Encyclopedie, published in 2004. In his article, Price acknowledged that the reason given in the primary sources for the rule of continence was, I quote, a perceived need for the higher clergy to remain in a state of constant purity, since cultic duties, the celebration of baptism of the Eucharist, can occur at any time and even daily. But Price went on, despite the quote that I just gave, Price went on to criticize those who used the language of ritual purity, cultic purity, as an explanation of clerical sexual continence. And I'll read you this quotation from Price. Modern commentators interpret this, that is the sexual continence requirement, as a case of concern for ritual or cultic purity the notion that certain physical functions, which could include eating or various forms of bodily excretion, as well as sex, while not sinful, induce a formal impurity that excludes entry into holy places or participation in sacred rites. This interpretation must, however, be rejected as anachronistic. Late antique Christianity was not a primitive religion. By the fourth century, the purity rules of Greek paganism had been reinterpreted in moral terms by Pythagoreans and other philosophers for centuries. And Christians had no conception of ritual purity as something distinct from moral and spiritual defilement. Anyway. Well, as Price's article proceeds, it becomes clear that he does not deny that the sexual continence regulation was meant to enforce some kind of purity and to avoid impurity for ritual purposes. But he is concerned to reject the idea of a purely physical kind of impurity. As he put it elsewhere in the article, early Christians regarded sex as impure, I quote, not because of the mere physiological fact of ejaculation, but because it involves of necessity the descent of the mind from its proper sphere into bodily passion. In the context of early Christian spirituality, 
that stress rationality, dispassion, and self-control, a rule of continence was fostered by disapproval, even disgust, towards what was conceived as a lamentable descent into sensual passion, inescapable in the act of making love, even when this occurred within marriage and for the sake of procreation. For Christ, then, it was the problem of sexual passion, something like the Augustinian concupiscence of the flesh, that led fourth century Christians to believe that sex and priestly ministry were incompatible, not the mere physical act itself. Well, there are problems, I think, with Christ's critique of the ritual purity hypothesis. First, he defines ritual or cultic purity very narrowly. It must be something he thinks purely physiological and not moral. But in the examples from the fourth century liter literature that I will cite further on, arguments for ritual purity are often mixed with moral and aesthetical concerns. This does not, in my view, make them any less ritual. The best illustration I can give is from the evidence that Christ himself cites for his view. Christ's evidence for this, this idea that the, the problem is the mind descending you know, from lofty thoughts down to, to passion, uh, his, his evidence uh, is a famous letter of Gregory the Great to Augustine of Canterbury, which was written about 200 years after the inquiry, which is a Problem. In any case, um, Augustine of Canterbury had written from England to Gregory, to Pope Gregory, asking for advice on a number of issues about ritual purity, uh, such as his menstruation, making a woman unclean and unable to enter church, uh, etc. Well, it was Gregory who described the problem with sexual impurity in the following terms. Quote, a man who makes love to his wife when his mind is bound by thoughts of illicit desire through pleasure. But because lawful intercourse with a wife cannot take place without bodily pleasure, he should abstain from entering a holy place, since pleasure itself cannot exist at all without sin. So Christ is correct that Gregory describes the impurity of sex as something that derives from illicit desire, from pleasure, and not from the physical act itself. However, if you look closely at Gregory's letter, and I'll give you another quotation from it, ritual concerns continue to be operative for him. For example, Gregory required ritual washing after sex. He cites the regulations of Leviticus 15, verse 60, that prescribed washing after sex, and specified that a man remained unclean until evening after emitting seed. While Gregory acknowledged that different nations had different customs, he went on to observe, quote, it has always been the practice of the Romans from ancient times that after a man has had intercourse with his own wife, he should seek purification by washing and abstain reverently from entering the church for a little while. In Gregory's view, even if a man was not overcome by irrational pleasure, he still had to wash after sex, but then he was allowed to go to church. Surely some kind of notion of ritual purity, of impurity, was at work here, even though Gregory tries to give it a spiritual or moral interpretation. But in the next portion of my talk, I would like to take a closer look at a number of the texts that date from the years when the sexual continence requirement was being developed in Rome, uh, that is roughly between the years 380 and 390. The authors of these texts include Pope uh, Damasus and Pope Sirikius, who are the, the earliest sources for the requirement, uh, the Church Father, Jerome, and an anonymous uh, biblical commentator.
whom modern scholars have come to call the Ambrose of Esther, or pseudo Ambrose. I would argue that these authors, even though they reveal a range of views on the purity or impurity of sex, uh, some of which fit a more physical uh, notion of ritual purity and others a more ascetic or moral notion, but all of them are concerned with the ritual dimensions and the ritual dangers of sexual behavior. Ritual purity concerns then are clearly operative even when other factors are present. The first text I will examine is taken from Jerome's commentary on Titus, composed early in his stay in Bethlehem uh, in 386. Here Jerome is interpreting uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 8, where the bishop is described as sophroga, which means self-restrained, but which Jerome wants to translate as chaste, uh, by which he means uh, continent, pudius. Well, to, to derive this interpretation, what Jerome has to do is invoke 1 Corinthians 7, 5, that's the passage where Paul recommends temporary sexual abstinence to married couples, he says, for the sake of prayer. That's a text we're going to see coming up here numerous times. Well, to do so, Jerome then invokes 1 Corinthians 7, 5, and a story from 1 Samuel, chapter 21, verses 4 through 6. He uses both of those passages from Corinthians and from Samuel as intertexts in order to give the text of Titus the emphasis on sexual continence that he wants to give. In the Samuel passage, King David has gone to the priest, Ahimelech, and requested bread for his men. The priest has only holy bread, or what's called the bread of the presence, but he is willing to give the bread to David and his men as long as the men are in a state of ritual purity, as long as they have stayed away from women. That's the best, okay? When David assures Ahimelech that the men are pure, they are given the bread to eat. In his commentary on Titus, Jerome employs the story as a way to endorse the sexual continence of priests, or in this case, bishops. Let the bishop be chaste, which the Greeks call sophomore. And the Latin translator, you probably in the earlier Latin versions, the Davis Latina, the Latin translator, fooled by the ambiguity of the word, translated as prudent instead of chaste. But if they then are commanded to abstain from intercourse with their wives for the sake of prayer, that's 1 Corinthians 7 5, what is one to think of a bishop who will daily offer intact victims for his own sins and those who? Jerome then invoked the story of David and Ahimelech and compared the bread of the presence with the Eucharistic body of Christ. And Jerome concludes that the difference between the two was as great as the difference between shadows and bodies and between images and truth. Jerome went on to note that if even David's soldiers were required to be sexually abstinent before eating the bread of the presence, how much more should a Christian bishop maintain his particular, his unique kind of chastity, his constantas propria, and his priestly purity, udicitia, sacerdotalis? Quote, and uh, sorry, I don't know the English there, just the Latin. Quote, so that the mind that is to consecrate the body of Christ should keep itself not only away from the unclean act, what would I say in Mundo, but even from the glance of an eye and from straying in its thoughts. Jerome's reference to the unclean act, Jerome's in Mundo, along with the evocation of ritual purity practiced by David's men, strongly suggests that Jerome saw some impurity in parents in the sexual act. And the fact that Jerome gets this linkage of 1 Corinthians 7 5 and the 1 Samuel passage, he gets that from Origen. And the commentary of 
wrote, and we know that Origen had this notion of uncleanness involved in modeling acts, and I think that's where he was getting the idea. A similar appeal to the text from Samuel is found in Jerome's book against Jovinian, composed in 393, which contained one of Jerome's most avid defenses of the ascetical life. In Against Jovinian 120, Jerome cited both Exodus 19.15, that's the passage where Moses commands the people to abstain from sex for three days uh, before the revelation uh, at Mount Sinai. So Jerome quotes Exodus 19.15 and again the Samuel passage, and this was his conclusion. The bread of the presence, like the body of Christ, cannot be eaten by those who are arising from the marriage bed. We must give thoughts to the words that Ahimelech said, have the young men kept pure for women. The truth is that in view, in view of the purity of the body of Christ, all sexual intercourse is unclean. Omnis quotus in mundus es or sit. Jerome's invocation of the language of impurity to describe marital sexual relations is striking. Under the influence of Origen's reading of 1 Corinthians 7 5 and its linguist with 1 Samuel 21 4, Jerome insisted on an absolute incompatibility between marital sexual relations and contact with the Eucharistic elements. Now, one objection one could make is that Jerome was an extremist. One could object that we shouldn't consider him a typical uh, defender of clerical sexual confidence. After all, uh, even among his contemporaries, he was considered a bit uh, on the far outside. And uh, as I documented in my book on Jovinian, um, uh, his own his book of Jovinian was subject to scathing critiques by several of his contemporaries. So we should look elsewhere. We should look, seek additional evidence to get another perspective on the requirement. I'd like to look now at a letter. Uh, it's called uh, To the Bishops of Gaul by Gallos Episcopos. It's usually been attributed either to Pope Ephesus or to his successor, um, Pope Cerebus, who succeeded Ephesus in 385. In the year 2005, uh, the French scholar Yves Marie Duval argued that Damasus was the author, and based on parallels uh, and echoes in the writings of Jerome, he argued that Jerome must have had a hand in the composition of the letter. If this theory is correct, and I think it probably is, the letter would have been written uh, either in 383 or 384, since Jerome had only arrived in Rome in 382 and he was expelled by the Roman clergy in 385. Uh, I thought see Discopos does echo some of Jerome's perspectives on sex, as we have encountered them in the commentary on Titus and the book against Jovinian. And so I'd like to present just a couple of examples of that. The papal letter, the papal letter is directed to bishops in Gaul, instructing them on a variety of disciplinary matters. Among the issues treated is the apparently widespread neglect of sexual continence among the clergy. After citing a number of scripture texts, such as Romans 8, that you are no longer in the flesh but in the spirit, 1 Corinthians 7 29, those who have wives should be as though they did not have them. Dallas began to discuss the requirement of purity or cleanness, munditia, and joined on the three highest ranks of the clergy. He characterized the minister who engages in sex as unclean, in mundus. Quote, shall an unclean man dare to contaminate what is holy when holy things are for He then cited the example of Old Testament priests who, uh, he claimed, spent the whole year of their service in the temple away from their home 
so that they could remain in a state of ritual purity. Ut mundi essent in the second quotation. He also noted, Damasus, that pagan priests sometimes observe sexual abstinence temporarily before undertaking sacrifices. Then Damasus posed this rhetorical question. And do you ask me whether the priest of the true God who is about to offer spiritual sacrifices ought to be in a state of perpetual purity and creation, or whether he should take care of the flesh while being totally in the flesh. If intercourse is pollution, see, mixtio pollutio est, obviously the priest ought to stand ready for the heavenly duty, lest he be found unworthy, since he is to intercede on behalf of the sins of others. At this point, Damas has cited 1 Corinthians 7, 5, and concluded that if even lay people are required to abstain from sex for the sake of prayer, the priest who engaged in sex might have the name of a priest, but not the merit. Well, for this reason, my beloved, I remind you that it is not proper for me to entrust the mystery of God to men who are so defiled and unfaithful, in whom the sanctity of the body is evidently polluted by filth and incontinence. Let them hear and mark well. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. It is striking how much the language of impurity and uncleanness permeates the letter of Gaulus Episcopus. It is also striking how closely the arguments of Damasus parallel the ones we have seen in Jerome's writings. These parallels have led Duval to conclude, correctly I think, that Jerome was, if not the actual author of the papal letter, at least a major influence on its thought and composition. Like Jerome, Damasus seems to have envisioned some kind of physical impurity to adhere to sexual activity of any kind. But this was not the last papal word on the subject. Subsequent popes, among them Seretius, the immediate successor of Damasus, also dealt with the issue. In a letter reporting the results of a synod held at Rome in 386, Sirikius offered a similar rationale for the imposition of sexual confidence as a requirement on the higher clergy. Uh, like Damasus and like Jerome, he cites 1 Corinthians 7 5. Sirikius, however, seems to take a somewhat more moderate position. I quote, Moreover, as it is worthy, chaste, and honorable, this is what we advise. Let priests and Levites and bishops and deacons have no intercourse with their wives, inasmuch as they are absorbed in the daily duties of their ministries. Paul, when writing to the Corinthians, told them, restrain yourself or abstain in order to be free for prayer. If lay people were asked to be continent, so that their prayers may be granted, all the more so should a priest be ready at every moment, confident in the purity of his clean state, his munditia, and not fearing the obligation of offering the sacrifice or baptizing. If he should be contaminated by carnal concupiscence, what would he do? What excuse would he have? With what shame, in what state of mind, would he carry out his functions? What testimony of conscience or merit would give him the trust to have his prayers granted when it is said to, to all who are pure themselves, everything is pure, but to those who have been corrupted and lack faith, nothing can be pure. Black Damasus, that's Jerome, Sirikius also invoked 1 Corinthians 7 5 and the language of purity and impurity to support the discipline of our sexual continence. I would suggest, however, that Sirikius speaks in a somewhat more moderate tone 
Moreover, he seems uh, to be more concerned with the issue of carnal concupiscence than with the uncleanness of the sexual act itself. In this respect, he fits more closely the position of Gregory the Great, uh, as described by Christ, where the influence of passion and loss was considered to be the main problem with sex and not the physical act itself. There is yet another third perspective on the fourth century continent's requirement, and this can be gleaned from the writings of that mysterious exegete known to modern scholars as Ambrosiaster. Ambrosiaster was a presbyter, a priest, writing at Rome during the reign of Damascus, and he represents the view that of one well-placed, uh, well-informed member of the clergy. We also know that he was sometimes at odds with opinions of Jerome, especially on matters relating to sex and marriage. In his commentary on the Epistles of Paul, at uh, his comment on 1 Corinthians 7, 5, Ambrosiaster took the occasion to reflect on the question of how sex could be something licit, on the one hand, and yet an obstacle to effective prayer, on the other hand. The passage is worth quoting here at length, because it shows that Ambrosiaster's thinking on the issue of sex and prayer differed in significant ways from the views of Damasus and Jerome, and even from that of Syracuse. You'll notice that because it's a biblical commentary, he cites the verse, part, or part of the verse, and then gives his comment. So, Paul writes, do not deprive one another. And Rosiaster says, Paul says this so that there may be an agreement between them regarding conjugal activity, lest disagreement give rise to fornication. And the next part of the verse, except perhaps by agreement for a time. His comment, that is, so that they should abstain for an agreed upon time in order to give thanks. And then on the critical part of the verse, to be free for prayer. And Rose asked his comment, now, although one ought to pray without ceasing, in allusion to 1 Thessalonians 5 17, for this practice should be observed, that his prayer should be observed throughout the entire day, nevertheless, in order that special devotion may be given to prayer, Paul enjoins that, a, that room be made for it at set intervals of time, in order to gain God's favor. Or in order to obtain God's mercy, one must pray to him in a cleaner state, Mundius. Although marital unions are clean, Pompus Munda sins communia, nevertheless one ought to abstain even from licit things in order that prayer may be directed more easily towards its effect. For even under the law, those who wish it to be sanctified abstain from the fruit of the vine, among other things, at the Lord's command, so that they might become holier. He's thinking of the Nazarite. <clears throat> For when a person does not touch even things that are allowed, he shows that he wishes to receive that for which he prays. And Rosiaster's comments here are significant for several reasons. First, he shows that he is aware of an exegetical tradition that we find in Tertullian and Jerome that linked Paul's suggestion about temporary abstinence, that is 1 Corinthians 7 5, with his teaching on perpetual prayer in 1 Corinthians, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5 17. Uh, according to this exegetical tradition, uh, Paul says on the one hand you have to abstain from prayer, on the other hand he says you have to pray always, therefore you can never have sex. That's Tertullian and Jerome's argument. Okay. Well, unlike Tertullian and Jerome, Ambrosiaster is clearly aware of that, that exegetical tradition. He refers to 1 Thessalonians, but he did not use the text of 1 Thessalonians to subvert Paul's permission regarding marital sex. On the contrary, 
And Rosiaster insists that conjugal group relations were both clean and licit. And he explained Paul's teaching about prayer and abstinence in terms of the greater effectiveness of prayer when it's offered along with sexual abstinence. Moreover, Ambrosiaster's appeal to the example of the Nazarites is telling. He argues that abstention from sex is a sign of a person's greater zeal and desire to be heard. This zeal is demonstrated precisely in one's willingness to forego things that are licit, such as sex within marriage. Nowhere in Ambrosiaster's writings do we find any suggestion that sex itself might cause impurity or defilement. Similar observations can be made about Ambrosiaster's discussion of clerical sexual continence in another place. He also wrote a book called Questions on the Old and New Testaments. Uh, the final question in one version, number 127, is on the sin of Adam and Eve. And basically, it's an extended defense of the goodness of marriage and uh, sexual activity. Well, in the middle of this, um, this question, uh, Jerome, I'm oh, sorry, Ambrose Astor uh, raises the, the, the question, well, if, if, if sex is perfectly all right, why are the clergy not allowed to have intercourse, the higher clergy not allowed to have intercourse with their wives? And to respond to this question, he argues that, well, sometimes even married Christians were required occasionally uh, to refrain from sex in order to facilitate uh, prayer. He mentions uh, certain feast days, uh, certain processions where abstinence is uh, required or appropriate. Then he turns to the topic of sexual abstinence among the clergy. And he argues that a higher degree of purity required of the clergy does not imply that sex was either illicit or unclean. In other words, there's a lower degree of purity of cleanness in marriage, there's a higher degree of purity or cleanness in uh, sexual abstinence. The priest of God must be cleaner or more pure, he says, Mundior, purior, because of his special role as the vicar of Christ, as the vicarius, or the legate of Christ. The priest acts in the place of Christ, in the daily duties of prayer, baptism, offering the Eucharist. But the existence of a higher state of purity, Ambrosiaster argues, is not grounds for negating the purity of the lower state. He's very explicit on this point, and he offers this analogy. Just as in comparison to the lamb, shadows are not only obscure, but also sordid. But in comparison with the stars, uh, but in comparison with the stars, a lamb is darkness. But in comparison with the sun, the stars are cloudy. But in comparison with the brightness of God, the sun is night. So those things that are licit and clean for us are, so to speak, illicit and unclean in respect to the dignity of God. God's ministers, in Rosie has to argue, must be mundiores, cleaner, more pure, puriores than ordinary people because of their special role as intercessors before God and as representatives or the common need of God before the community. And he insists that a higher purity of their state does not imply that the lower purity is any less pure. All of that, he says, reflects that, that the highest purity of the transcendent God. Well, these passages from Jerome, Damasus, and Rosie Esther, its readings, show that there were different approaches to the issue of clerical sexual continence, even among those who support the requirement that all of the people I cited support required. My analysis suggests that there was a spectrum of thinking on the matter of sexual purity and impurity in its bearing on priesthood. If Jerome and Damasus were on one extreme emphasizing the impurity inherent in the sexual act, and if Ambrosiaster stood 
On the other extreme, arguing that sex in itself could never make a person unclean. Then Sarekius stood somewhere in the middle, arguing that sex could indeed defile a priest, but only because of the problem of carnal concupiscence. But all of these writers were concerned with the central question of how a priestly minister, that is a bishop, presbyter, or deacon, might embody the purity, the munizia, the holiness, the cleanness appropriate to ritual functions. In this sense, it seems to me quite appropriate to follow Louisan and those like him who would see ritual purity as the fundamental motivation underlying the rule sexual contacts. At this point, my time is almost up, uh, but I still would like to address one more question, although much more briefly. If it is the case, as I've argued, that the sexual contents restrictions have a fundamentally ritual motivation, namely to create a a, a priestly persona so that the priestly minister might be recognized as having the authority to have his prayers heard, to be an effective uh, uh, intercessor, and so forth. If these ritual concerns are the driving force behind the continent's requirement, then we are justified in asking, how did all this happen? I didn't happen. All the indications are that this was not the way it was in the first, let's say, two centuries of the church. If the pastoral epistles, uh, that is one to Timothy and Titus uh, in the New Testament, are, are at all representative of the, the state of the clergy in the late first or early second century, the ideal bishop, presbyter, and deacon uh, was a married man who had raised children and demonstrated his suitability for church office by running his own household. At the end of the second century, Clement of Alexandria could hold up the married householder as the model of church leadership, superior, I would argue, even to the celibate. How and why then did sexual abstinence become such an important marker of distinction? How did it come to define um, uh, Ritual holiness becomes such an emblem of ritual holiness at the end of the fourth century. This is a very big question, and in the few minutes remaining, I can offer only fragments of an answer. Uh, but I do have three, three, three points. My first response is that it did not happen all at once. Before the appearance of the requirement of complete sexual continence in the fourth century. There was a prohibition on ordaining men who had been married more than once. This prohibition seems to have become customary at some point in the third century, although it did not enter canon law until the fourth century. Several thoughtful Christians, such as Origen and Augustine, reflected on the reasons for the prohibition of the remarriage from the clergy. Both Origen and Augustine realized that remarriage was not prohibited for ordinary Christians. So why should we be an obstacle, they asked, for the clergy? Origen argued uh, that in some cases, a twice married man might actually be more self-restrained than somebody who had been married once. <laughs> uh, and his argument was that uh, if the twice married man had lost both wives early in his life and then had lived for a long time in continence, then he might in fact be more self-restrained than the man who had only one wife but who had remained sexually active with that one wife throughout his whole life. So he knew it couldn't be a guarantee of virtue. Well, for both Origen and Augustine, the single marriage requirement for the clergy had symbolic value. It symbolized the unity and permanence of the bond between Christ and the church. Augustine even refers to it as the sacrament. This notion of priesthood as a kind of symbol, I think, is where we must look for an explanation of the continence requirement. A second approach to this question 
would be to take a hint from the social anthropologists. Since the late 1960s, an emerging body of literature on purity and impurity, much of it influenced by the work of Mary Douglas, has shed light on the phenomenon of purity rules in many cultures. The central insight of these studies is that purity regulations, and especially rules that govern bodily orifices, often function symbolically. The human body frequently functions as a symbol of the community, and concerns about bodily purity often reflect concerns and ways of dealing with um, the boundaries between the community and the surrounding world. When we apply this to the question of the priest's body as a symbol, such an approach promises to be very fruitful. One thing we know about Christianity in the third and fourth centuries is that it spread widely in the Greek and Roman world, and eventually, by the end of the fourth century, was adopted as the official religion of the Roman Empire. These dramatic events especially affected the clergy. Already in the third century, we hear complaints from men such as Cyprian and Origen about the growing worldliness of the clergy. By the late fourth century, especially in the West, the boundaries between the church and the empire, and between the clergy and the world, had become increasingly porous. It is easy to imagine that regulations about clerical sexual continence would have functioned to establish at least some clear and minimal boundary between the church and the ever encroaching world. Finally, we must not forget that the sexual continence regulation also served to establish a boundary not only between the church and the world, but also within the church itself. A boundary between clergy and laity, and also a boundary between the higher and the lower ranks of the clergy, the lower ranks, lecture, uh, so forth, were uh, some deacon acolyte uh, were allowed to now, it is important to remember that the authority of the clergy was never a given in the early church. It was always something that had to be constructed and defended against rival sources of authority. The ascetic, charismatic, or in the fourth century, the imperial. Even the adoption of the language of priest and priesthood to describe the bishop and much later the presbyter was a development that took place in the third century, especially in North Africa, under the pressure of rival claims to spiritual authority from confessors and even from other presbyters. Establishing a priestly identity for the ordained ministers was a work in progress in the fourth century. Regulations about single marriage, and I didn't even mention, but there are also uh, Old Testament regulations about the wives that priests could marry that Christians adopt in the fourth century. So regulations about single marriage, about the wives of priests, and ultimately about sexual continence were one means of establishing hierarchy, of setting a boundary, of making a difference. 